Hello, I'm Martin Birchall um, and I'm an ENT surgeon in London. Um, I'm actually what's called a laryngologist, so I specialise in voice, swallowing and breathing. Um, and presentation today will be on uh, throat, but also some other ENT manifestations of EDS hypermobility. Uh, and I will talk you through where we think we are in terms of describing the problems people have and then starting to think about treatments and self-care. Um, so uh, this presentation is jointly with Gary Wood, who I think might be also presenting elsewhere. Uh, he's a specialist speech and language therapist, and we both work at University College London uh, and uh, University College Hospital in central London. I'd like to thank um, Alan and Lara particularly for inviting us to talk and, uh, and just really compliment them on the staggering work that they do for the benefit of the world EDS community, both uh, uh, now in the past and I'm sure in the future as well. So, so this is uh, our hospital. It's a brand new hospital on the Euston Road in central London. Um, and uh, we have some great facilities. Um, I'm the thin guy on the left and Gary is the slightly better padded person on the right. So if you ever come to see us as a team, then you'll know what to expect. We like to think that uh, we uh, are highly professional in all respects. Uh, I am nothing to declare really, uh, particularly. I've historically had some positions with companies, but not at the moment. And I supervise a student who's jointly funded by GSK. So uh, I'm pretty independent really. So just to start with a little bit of anatomy and physiology. Um, so as I say, I'm a laryngologist. I deal with the larynx, the voice box, and uh, the larynx is sitting in the front part of the throat. Um, and it's sitting below a bone here, which is called the hyoid bone. So the hyoid bone is kind of horseshoe shaped bone. It's the only free floating bone in the body actually. Um, and here you can see it's suspended by a couple of ligaments from the base of the skull up here. This is the jaw, this is the spine at the back here, and the voice box is in blue with some red muscles in it, windpipe coming down the bottom here. So the higher bone here, the muscles of the tongue issue off uh, the top of the higher bone coming forwards, and the mu muscles of swallowing come from the back of the hyoid and the larynx, and the larynx is suspended from the hyoid and therefore indirectly from the base of the skull and the tongue. Well, these are all very free floating structures and they're held in place by um, pairs of muscles and ligaments on each side of the throat in order to keep them where they are. Um, and so you can see, I hopefully quite quickly, how just minor disruptions in the pairings of these, these 30 pairs of muscles down each side of the throat and 20 paired ligaments, how you know, just minor changes in those can really offset the way that the throat functions, leading to kind of weird problems with choking, with hoarseness, um, breathing issues at times, uh, and pain. Because when things slip out of kilter on one side, the muscles on the other side tighten up in response. And so you can get uh, occult pains and chronic pain and soreness um, in, the, in the throat um, just through instability. You can see how this can happen with people with EDS hypermobility and why it's not surprising that we found that problems with um, swallowing, with choking uh, and speaking are actually really quite common uh, in, uh, in, the, in these conditions. Um, so on either side, as I say, we've got these guy, guy, guy ropes, guy stays, uh, like the ones that are holding a mast in place in a boat. Uh, or alternatively holding up um, aerials. Um, and so all of these have to be acting in concert. And when they don't act in concert, that's when problems occur. And it, the, here are the 30 muscle groups and uh, 20 ligament groups that I've been talking about on either side of the larynx, which is in the center of the picture here. And the hyoid bone, which actually is a real fulcrum in the center here where my laser pointer is uh, just sitting there. And the hyoid can slip out sideways from time to time with hypermobility. Dysphagia is difficulty in swallowing. Um, and when that occurs, you can also get choking as well. And you need a team approach to manage problems in the throat. So whilst I can do some of the diagnosis and management, most of it is actually delivered in practice by a speech and language therapist or speech pathologist who is trained in swallowing. And these people are rare beasts, but incredibly valuable. Um, also, you need to make sure that the oral input um, to swallowing is intact 
the first phase of swallowing is in the mouth. So you need to have good teeth, working temper and mandibular joints. And I know a lot of you will be rolling your eyes at the thought of normally working temper and mandibular joints. But I mean, we do need that as well in order to chew properly. And sometimes a dietitian can help. So we know there are lots of GI issues that happen with EDS. Um, slow motility, but also altered bowel flora. And the input of a dietitian is critical. Um, neurologists, sometimes, not that often, but certainly gastroenterologists. Um, people with EDS hypermobility can get reflux, classic reflux. In fact, you know, about 40% of the um, uh, population in most countries do get some element of reflux. But a lot of the problems are not down to reflux, they're due to the slow motility. And the fact that the stomach doesn't empty quickly and the esophagus doesn't empty quickly. So working with gastroenterology is critical. There are four phases of normal swallow, as I say, the oral preparatory phase. So this is where you are, are taking things in. Um, and it starts with the mind actually thinking about swallowing and salivating, putting things in. The lip seal has to be good and moving things around with the tongue, the chewing. Uh, and then there's the oral phase where after chewing, and you've got a nice bolus, you throw the food to the back of the throat, and that then triggers the pharyngeal phase, uh, which starts with the larynx and pharynx coming upwards and forwards and opening up the hole at the back for the food to go down. And you'll see this in some of the videos in a minute. And then there's the esophageal phase where we get the um, peristalsis of the esophagus and stuff clearing, which, as I say, doesn't always work perfectly either. So you can see immediately how there are lots of areas in which people with EDS had mobility might have problems with their swallowing, be it from the chewing, the temporal and joint, the pharyngeal phase, the movement of the larynx, all the actual esophaguses. So this is what's called a video fluoroscopy, and this is a the kind of index investigation for people with swallowing and choking problems. So here the, the person in these videos has um, got food which is mixed with a contrast that will show up on x-ray. Um, so I'll just run this on. This is called video fluoroscopy. And what you can see here is that food is going down. And the key bits here are that the tongue is throwing stuff to the back. See, so going to the back and immediately triggers the larynx and hyoid moving upwards. So the hyoid bone is here and the larynx is below it. The larynx is cartilaginous, so you can't really see most of it on a video fluoroscopy or an X-ray, but the hyoid you can. So I'll just show you that again. <clears throat> so the hyoid is coming upwards and forwards on swallowing, and that opens up the space at the back for other things to happen. So if the hyoid is not moving properly, there are big issues. And that's not running very well, but you can see how when things go wrong, things can actually slip down the wrong way. Uh, and cause choking. This is uh, on the right hand side of the picture is a typical setting for video fluoroscopy with the speech therapist here administering the food and drink. There is huge, huge dearth of literature around this. There are less than 10 papers in the world literature dealing with throat problems in EDS with a few case reports thrown in for good luck. So, which means that most of the time we're dealing with opinion and empiric observations. That is, suck it and see. Let's try something and see if it works. There are no randomized trials. There are no big series of, of investigations. Here are some pictures of the throat in a patient, uh, multiple patients actually with uh, EDS. In A, we are looking down and at the back of the picture in all of these images um, is the uh, spine. Uh, and this, at the front is the voice box looking like a kind of squid or monster sitting within the throat. Uh, with a, a flappy thing, which you can see best in B actually, called the epiglottis. The epiglottis, which you can see here in B and down the bottom in E here, is a trapdoor. So when the larynx comes upwards and forwards, the trapdoor closes and stops food and drink going down the wrong way, hopefully. Um, the vocal cords are the things in the centre here in a V shape, right vocal cord here, left vocal cord here, coming together in B uh, here, uh, there, right vocal cord, left vocal cord, right vocal cord, left vocal cord. Uh, and round the back on a swallow, as the larynx comes up, it opens up this space at the back to allow food and drink to go down into the esophagus. So that's what's supposed to happen normally. But in EDS, it doesn't always happen. Normally, vocal cords are much closer together than they are in A. In EDS, I had mobility, the larynx is very mobile and can open widely. Um, and there's a huge range of movement, which actually means that uh, it comes no surprise to you to know that there are a lot of singers and performers and actors who have hypermobility 
because they're able to move their larynx around a lot more than others, it's quite likely that Freddie Mercury, for example, had um, uh, hypermobility as well. Um, here in C is a mouth with EDS, and there's a lot of tooth grinding going on here um, and jaw problems as well. Um, and in E, again, we can see the wide dilatation, but also um, a lot of coloration of the top part of the larynx, which is due to throat clearing. Throat clearing is really bad for the throat. So those of you who are dealing with throat problems by clearing their throat, um, try and stop doing that and just take little sips of water every time you want to clear your throat and try not to because it's quite damaging for the system. A couple of case reports. So case one, 37 year old lady with hypermobile EDS, three years of worsening choking attacks, um, and which can be terrifying. So when things go down the wrong way, it really feels like you're dying and you're not going to be able to breathe. That never actually happens. The throat always does clear and it generally does so within 30 seconds, in fact. Um, with these episodes, people are often diagnosed with asthma, but actually asthma treatments don't really help. And here where we examine the throat using the endoscopy methods I've shown you, or flashing light on and off course stroboscopy, we found that the, the larynx was too wobbly, too mobile. The little bones at the back of the larynx were flopping into the voice box and causing intermittent obstruction. Uh, there are also some signs of reflux or failure of clearance as well. So a number of things for us to deal with. Um, here at the top picture in the darker pink, um, you can't see the vocal cords. So these don't look like the pictures I've been showing you before, mainly because the arytenoids, which are here and here and here and here, are flopping inwards. Here's one of my patients at the bottom here, where the arytenoids are flopping inwards and causing a, some obstruction and interference with the airway. Uh, and this is what it should have looked like. It should have been wide open um, as here. Um, there are breathing tests that you can do, which will confirm that the problem is in the upper airways and not in the lungs, as it would be in asthma. So what we did here was I was able to inject some steroids around the back of the larynx, which you can do under local anaesthetic or general anaesthetic. Uh, and that helped reduce the, the secondary pain and discomfort that had occurred, as, it do, as one might do around other joints uh, in the rest of the body in hypermobility. Pridiofroscopy showed a little bit of aspiration of fluids and slow movement to the esophagus, typical of EDS. Um, and speech therapy and respiratory therapy were instituted to strengthen the swallowing, um, but also help relax some of the tight muscles that we saw as well. Gastroenterology to, for management of slow esophageal motility. And in fact, we tried an agent called Prucalipride, which some of you may have come across. Um, it also helps with people with slow lower bowel issues as well. Um, and Gary got stuck in as well, and as well as targeting reflux, um, worked on balancing the vocal tract, trying to get those guy ropes to work properly and in concert, and using a particular set of exercises called lax box exercises, uh, which are, are very helpful with hypermobile problems, uh, and getting rid of some, some of the unhelpful uh, issues. Case two, this is a 39-year-old lady with uh, intermittent hoarseness, uh, and had previously been diagnosed with the right vocal cord palsy that got better. And in fact, what was happening was that the, the, the cricoarotenoid joint, these two little tiny joints at the back of the vocal cords, like other joints in the body, can sublux, they can slip out of place. And when they do that, um, you get a situation that looks and feels like a vocal cord palsy, when in fact it's just slipping out of place. On stroboscopy, it appeared that the left sort of vocal cord was immobile, but actually it, it did slip in and out, in fact. Uh, and we managed this with a small amount of temporary filler to take the strain off, off both vocal cords. Um, and I use hyaluronic acid, which actually wears off after three months, which just, it's a natural substance. You're not putting anything too foreign into the body. And it just helps take the strain away for a, for a short period of time in combination with some speech therapy as well. Um, so here uh, we are injecting the vocal cord, which can, again can be done to local anaesthetic, um, with a small amount of sedation into the vocal cord and just injecting it to, to relieve the strain. So I'll try and just try and move this up a bit. So there's the injection and it's bulking up this area here. And therapy, again, we dealt with some reflux issues, um, increased vocal cord function with steaming, increasing fluids, and spacing out the vocal load. This is very important if you're getting issues with your voice, uh, that you, like other parts of the body, we know that other parts of the body, you've got to space out your exercise effort. 
but not stop moving. And that's also critical here. As with other parts of the body in HEDS, you've got to keep, uh, use it or lose it really. And again, the lax fox exercises and working on unhelpful muscle tension. Some, there are some forms of external laryngeal and throat massage, which can help. And we've also found that a particular form of therapy called uh, myofascial release therapy can also be really, really helpful in getting rid of some of the adverse muscle tensions. Um, so children can also have issues. Uh, there's only one report that we've seen in the literature on this. Um, and a lot of the issues in the upper airway um, in children with um, HEDS and hypermobility are really down to um, some localised inflammation. Um, so a lot of allergy issues uh, and respiratory symptoms. But you need to be aware that they might also be getting some issues with the larynx. And if you're not sure, then um, a laryngologist can take a look. So what I'm going to show you here is uh, what I call the hyoid roll. So here, a patient with EDS is blowing air into the throat. And as they do so, it extends the back of the throat. And you can see the hyoid bone here, this horseshoe shaped bone on either side here, is rolling in. So it's still covered in mucous membrane. But this is a striking example of of how important the hyoid is um, and, and how it can be influenced by hypermobility. It's a very bendy hyoid that's coming into the throat and it can in fact be dislocated at times. So this is an example of a patient where the hyoid bone is actually whizzing sideways across the throat. And I have seen this. Um, so more often it just subluxes a little bit, just shifts a bit. And so you, you can get intermittent lumps in the side of the neck. Sometimes they're a bit tender, where the higher bone has moved across, and then they just go back again. Uh, and they can be investigated as neck lumps, when in fact it's just the higher bone that's unstable. Uh, there's the higher bone in the middle there, and it can slip across to the side. So um, this is a, a lady, and uh, you've seen this before, but this is a lady who has hyperextensibility and, and an element of Chiari malformation as well. So as she moves her neck, um, there's quite a lot going on externally, but also internally as well. Um, and it's quite likely that there are brainstem issues. So um, some people with um, HEDS can get tinnitus or vertigo. And this is probably um, due to a little bit of the brainstem slipping in and out. Uh, and I'm now working with a colleague at UCL and UCLH, uh, Nish Mater, who's a newly appointed um, ear and balance specialist, to see whether we can investigate this a little bit more and develop treatments for people with HEDS who are getting tinnitus uh, and balance issues. Uh, this is a very busy slide. You'll find this in um, Alan Hakim's wonderful new self-help guide and guide to various problems in EDS hypermobility. It's uh, an algorithm we've developed um, for uh, the, the different things that can be done to help you. Um, so no need to go through that now. A lot of it I've already said anyway, but it's in Alan's brand new book that's coming out. Um, so as I say, there's a lot that we don't know. Um, we are at the stage at the moment and, and have published um, on uh, describing uh, what we're starting to see. So as we're, we've built up our experience of people with throat problems uh, with HEDS and um, hypermobility spectrum and other forms of EDS as well, classical, um, and vascular as well. Um, we are describing more and more what the issues are um, and starting to develop some ideas about how we might manage those things. Uh, we're finding that um, people actually have already taken matters into their own hands but uh, or have been managed by people who aren't familiar with HEDS and some of the um, self-applied um, treatments or um, kind of less EDS aware clinician applied treatments are not totally appropriate. And so having to change those around a bit. We are increasing our understanding and Hannah Williams, who's a speech therapist, master's student at London City University, has, uh, with the help of Hannah and her team at uh, the EDS Society, uh, have completed a very large, the world's biggest ever survey of throat problems in EDS, ENT problems in general. Uh, and the volume of data is such that it will probably take at least two PhDs to analyse it all. Uh, in the end, we had almost 2,000 responses from the community. So anybody who's listening who, who assisted, many, many thanks for feeding, feeding back to us. Uh, we've been able to have large enough groups to get um, really detailed statistical analysis of a classical EDS, HEDS and HSD, 
but also some insight into other types of EDS as well. Uh, some very high level early findings. There are significant differences in presentation between the groups, in fact. Uh, for example, voice, TMJ and tinnitus is different between these. Um, we also looked at uh, the treatments, as I say, self and professionally administered. And there's a wide range of responses, many of which are counterproductive. Also impact on quality of life and even impact on employment. So there's a lot that's going to be coming out. Um, Hannah is presenting at another part of this conference. So do look out for her presentation where she'll be giving you the early high level results uh, from our survey. Um, but a lot more will be coming out over the next few years as we understand that more. And importantly, they're generating hypotheses about how we can treat things. And we hope the next step will be designing clinical trials, uh, which will help uh, people day to day. So this is an early study that we did um, that was published by Chong Lam, who was another student of ours, who's now a junior doctor. Um, and we found that choking was a big problem. Uh, globus, a feeling of a lump in the throat, was also a big problem. Uh, and also quite a lot of people with this higher subluxation. Uh, swallowing uh, affected about 50% of the people in this much smaller study that we've published already. Uh, we uh, have patient reported outcome measures. Um, and we found that there are problems with reflux, although as we've discussed, it's not necessarily reflux, it can be regurgitation um, or failure of clearance because the esophagus and stomach aren't getting rid of stuff. Um, dysphagia and voice. So RSI covers reflux, E10 is a, a self-completion questionnaire covering swallowing, and VHI covers a voice as well. But this was very small and there was not a lot to go on. Um, we clearly, there are lots of reflux symptoms going on in HEDS, difficulties in swallowing quite a lot, and low level hoarseness. Our big survey that Hannah's analysing will be able to tell us a lot more though, uh, when we get to the end of that. Uh, here's some advice from my partner in crime, Gary. Uh, understand your limitations and abilities. Um, strengthening and relaxing the muscles are equally important as they are in other parts of the body. And you'll be hearing this from the people talking on musculoskeletal issues. For swallowing, if you're struggling, eat little and often, but don't stop. <laughs> don't stop. It's critical that you, you do keep things going. Um, you may need to process food if things are really bad, but also reflux, classical reflux needs to be controlled because there's an overlap with classical reflux as well. For voice, again, vocal naps, so spreading out your efforts. Don't be zooming continuously for eight to 10 hours a day. You need to avoid extremes, so do not scream, limit the amount of shouting. I know if you've got kids, it's impossible, but try and limit it a bit. And also support the voice with training. Try and find a speech and language therapist who gets it. Uh, so we know that people with EDS and hypermobility have problems with their throats. We need to educate more, educate you, the community, educate clinicians um, very much. Uh, it's not a standard part of education for most specialties, and it needs to be. More and better data, we're working on that, standardised outcomes, multidisciplinary workings, developing networks and teams of people who do get it so that, you know, I know that I'm working with gastroenterologists and dietitians and speech therapists and neurologists who really do understand EDS. Close engagement speech therapy, patient involvement is critical too, um, and hopefully we'll be able to start developing uh, the interventional clinical trials that will prove that the ideas that we've got are beneficial for you. So there we are. Uh, that's me. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions at the end of this session. Thank you very much.